Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some recent research I've done. I'm actually going to do it somewhat quickly because I'm in the cleanup position. So I'd like to respond a little bit to uh, what some of my colleagues before me have said. Uh, one reason I want to is because I consider myself a scholar of political parties and of congressional elections. And so I came to campaign finance because of those questions. And so I'm not um, primarily interested in campaign finance for its own sake. Um, you'll see where I'm going. So the first thing that I want to point out is that what Diane Dwyer and I did, we presented this at a conference earlier this year, is looked about um, at the division between inside and outside groups, if there is one, in house elections. So the thing that I would like to point out is, is that, first of all, a lot of the discussion that we hear about these issues focuses on the presidency. And it focuses also on this division between the idea of inside and outside sources. So in the party world these days, there's a lot of emphasis on an extended party network theory, which is to say that perhaps interest groups aren't a concern as much as people make them out to be, because <coughs> if they are just other manifestations of political party goals, then maybe we're concerned about the wrong kind of thing. So what we looked at is, uh, is some of the major players in the 2014 House elections to see if we can categorize them as being inside the network or um, outside the network. And also we're concerned about whether political parties are still central in the system because after all, that's one of the things that we, we seem to conclude about democracies is that parties are central. And so if parties are doing well and people identify with the parties, then the rest of the system may be of uh, doing all right. So the first thing that I want to show you here is that this is a chart of total outside spending by non-party groups from you know, 2004 to 2014. Um, and it is in current dollars that hasn't been uh, adjusted for inflation. And let me first point out to you the green lines. So the first green line, the nice big one, is in, in 2012. So this is uh, the outside spending in the 2012 presidential election that came about because of Citizens United, right? We, we had an easier way to spend that money. But let me also point out to you that uh, the 2004 line, it's a shorter line. This is for Citizens United. Some of you may recall, um, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. So as Dave Maddie just pointed out, they really need a super PAC to go ahead and mount an independent campaign that was ideologically driven um, and that wasn't uh, disclosed in a traditional manner. You just had to use a clunkier mechanism for that. It even went down a little bit um, in 2008, but now look at um, these red lines. That's the outside spending in Senate races. And as you can see in 2014, the reason why uh, we talked a lot about it and we studied this um, extensively is that there were a lot a very important Senate race in 2014, the, and the control of the chamber. Uh, the control of the chamber was uh, was in, in play, and in fact, it did change party control. So there was an enormous amount of spending on Senate races. But by contrast, look at the blue lines are showing us with the House. Is that um, there? There have been some years, 2006, when control of the House changes. Um, in 2010, you see that there was more spending, but in 2014, it goes down even. Um, and it's commensurate with what was four years ago. So this is what I want you to think about um, as I can go forward. So when you are looking at interest group spending, you have to ask yourself whether they're affiliated groups, affiliated with the central party mission, or whether they're outside. And that's what the data we showed you all the different kinds of groups. That's one of the, the questions that um, we're really begging there, is how, um, how much they're doing this. And then, of course, how much some of those groups might be act, um, acting as proxies for political parties. Several of our speakers talked about um, how parties are really reluctant to get involved in primaries. And in some states, by the way, they can't do that. So an interest group that has your interest at heart might be a good uh, proxy for doing that. And also, parties act predominantly in general elections. 
because of the competitiveness issue, and that, and that is they, um, they're, they're being told at, um, at the end who, which party controls the seat, not necessarily the personality or the name of the person that's in there. And some of these, if, if the group is affiliated, it just should align with this kind of party behavior, um, and anti establishment groups will act differently. So now I'm about to show you some network analyses that we, um, well, I'm engaged in, I can get the right thing. Um, before I do that, we looked at, and this is just 2014 House elections, the network of congressional campaign committees, prominent interest groups, prominent super PACs, and uh, what we hypothesized as contrarian uh, interest groups. Uh, we, we talked very much, we was a little bit of an um, undertone in this campaign about the Tea Party and Freedom Works and, uh, and things like this. Uh, have they seen their last day? Are they really how far outside of the mainstream are they? Uh, likewise, we looked at the Service Employees International Union on the Democratic side, which is um, one of the largest and most important uh, unions in the United States, and also traditionally has farther left than mainstream Democratic um, positions. Uh, in addition, we looked at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and the House Majority Pact. And as I have here with the asterisk, uh, we expect these other groups to be opposed to the party's central vision. The other uh, part of this context to consider is that even in 2014, which is a midterm election year, you see that the number of races where each of these political actors spent the funds, by and large, with the exception of SEIU is, and, and the Chamber of Commerce, is less than it even had been in 2012. So we do have a problem with a number of competitive races um, that are still there, but uh, it's really remarkable how little um, even the party committees were engaged. All right, so here's my first network analysis graph to show you. This is the Republican primary network in 2014, and the blue boxes are those spenders in that network that I was talking to you about. Um, Chamber of Congress is, is up there um, on the top, and then the uh, free works and NRC is there on the bottom, and then all off to its lonesome is the American Crossroads. And the, uh, the, the measures that we have here um, show us something uh, uh, very interesting and maybe somewhat unexpected, uh, that in the primaries, it's the Chamber of Commerce is the most central actor in this. What the little uh, red line show you is that those that are on the outside, those are the races that only that actor engaged in. The ones toward the middle, where you see multiple lines, those are the races that more than one of these actors engage in. So you can see that there's um, some very interesting, but as you see in other um, the slides that I'll quickly show you, uh, this is actually very diffuse. There's not a lot of races that we're talking about here uh, that any of these actors uh, sent in. What it turned out was that um, the NRCC and the Chamber of Commerce overlapped in five races. Uh, in the primaries where they both supported the same side. So we see very clearly that even though the chamber is spending separately from the party, they're doing the same kinds of things. They're echoing the party's goals. And then what's also interesting in that previous graph is that there are um, also a lot of races where Freedom Works in the chamber were the only two groups, Chamber of Commerce, that uh, spent in these primaries but in three of them, uh, two of them are funny because of this uh, situation when a House member could run for Senate and how um, they were doing something uh, differently there. But in these bottom three, Idaho, Ohio, Texas, uh, they are explicitly opposing each other. That is, every time the Tea Party starts to engage, the Chamber of Commerce <coughs> engages against uh, their goals. And finally, there's only uh, two races uh, really, where all three groups spent, and you can see um, similar kinds of things happening as well, that um, the Freedom Works in the Chamber are consistently opposing on the NRCC and that, that one California race spent on the incumbent <coughs> and then later sending the former time. So um, there's a very limited amount of, um, of overlapping activity, but it still tells us something. For the general election, now look at the NRCC, right? That is a much denser graph, many more races that the party is, uh, is being involved in. And only a few that where the 
We have anecdotes. We, oh. don't have, we have terrible disclosure under the Federal Corrupt um, Practices Act. Um, between, so uh, if we can, I can go on forever, but I think that there is a lot of history that some people in this room would remember experienced in real time about what corporations, for example, would do or wouldn't do that wouldn't have necessarily uh, risen to the level of, of campaign spending on television because that wasn't really how you achieved influence in Congress. Um, I'll get to more about this in a second. The, uh, in, in the post peak era to the early 1990s was a time when you had campaign disclosure, but she could give congressmen gifts. And we're not talking about you know a couple of football tickets here or there that sometimes seems to get um, the journalists uh, very upset. I'm talking about investigative missions to the Caribbean and to Europe and to place, I've got, got a colleague who here who remembers these kinds of things. Um, it's not until we have an explicit gift ban that the ways in which you would influence members had to all be disclosed. People didn't go ahead and, and put all this stuff down on there. It was really pretty um, common to be the case. The same thing now about lobbying prohibitions. At the last um, APSA conference, I was at a panel where somebody was talking about the, um, thank you, I can just see that. The, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, lobbying prohibitions on members once they leave. And that is true, that is, they clamped down that, on that significantly, but apparently not on even a corporate board. And in fact, the fellow who was doing this research found that the average amount of time that it took for a member of Congress upon their retirement or defeat to be appointed to a corporate board was five days. <laughs> five days. So there is there's to me that open question. Um, the growth of the number of groups is also something that I want to speak to for just a second. Is it, are all of them active? That's really the important question. We have a lot of PACs, but what I have found, my husband's a venture capitalist, is that if it doesn't cost you anything to maintain it, why would you close it down? You don't know in this environment what the Supreme Court's going to say is illegal. You don't know what other kind of regulatory uh, rule may come down that changes things. So. Um, it's, it's, the question is more because um, all those groups are active. Second, about disclosure. I have been doing other research on this, and what is gets lost often in the conversation is that we are by far the most transparent system in the world. In the world, there is no other country that will give you this level, flawed though it may be, of disclosure. And so, so part of the question is whether should we strive to be even more disclosed than this because of what are we getting in return for that? Um, the other thing, by the way, is that I also found that no democracy, and I have to understand this, no democracy can keep private money in another system. I don't care how much you've heard about public funding in other places. They can't decide what's the best way to give the funding to the parties, to give the funding to the candidates, and no matter what has happened, I can cite like many examples, every single democracy can't keep somebody who's determined, um, like with Sheldon Adelson, uh, from spending their money to, from doing it. It just can't be done. And the last thing, and I think the most important, which we'll take up on the other um, panel, I feel certain, is to ask yourself about what these super PACs are spending on. Um, they have been said now they're getting in to get out of the vote um, in events, but consistently they have been spending enormous amounts on television. The ones when Paul Hurdson talks about the 18 races where outside groups outspent, uh, he's absolutely right, but it's virtually all on television. And so now I'm going to talk to this group, you students in the room. This is something that actually has frustrated me enormously, is that think of yourselves as students right now and not necessarily the leaders of politics in another 10 or 15 years. And let me say this to you. How many of you are watching television in real time? I got a 17-year-old. She watches, she consumes all sorts of TV. But you have all figured out how to avoid all the ads. <laughs> Haven't you figured this out, right? So you know you can get the content that you want without the messages that you don't want to receive. What our colleagues in political behavior have found out, I'm hoping some people will comment on this in the next one, is that, you know what, there's a saturation effect. Even if you can be persuaded by TV ads, after six or eight or 16 showings, you're not paying attention anymore. What we also found in political science is that the door-to-door, -door shoe leather, personal connection is 
much more effective than spending on television commercials are, and yet some of the real value of that is not accounted for in the way that we dispose campaigns many, because if you all are spending 100 hours a week volunteering for a campaign, what's that worth to the campaign? It's invaluable what it's worth to the campaign, but it doesn't get reported as a cost that's spent. And so um, social media turns out to be very cheap, right? Um, and the amount that you could spend on Facebook or um, other kinds of platforms compared to um, the television take is really considerable. So finally, the, I would think, I would say to you, don't cede your power to cash. And I think that that would be the message that I would send, is that you need to, check, it's not like money isn't important, but you need threshold amounts, not absolute um, parity. It's not an arms race. We have many examples of self-financed candidates who can't, but who lose spectacularly, like the thing of Linda McMahon in Connecticut. Um, $80 million she spent one cycle, $100 million to get the U.S. Senate, and, and she, I think in the last one, she got beat by a fellow who spent $20 million. So um, this is the thing that, um, that I would like you to focus on. Ernst had also talked about how the super PAC money is not at all correlated with public support. That ought to tell you something right there, right? It's just because people can, um, can put the money in the account. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, that they're going to.